up everybody welcome back to a people's historian the show where we, we read about 30 minutes of history together my name is Jason Kishinev and we are starting chapter 4 of defining moments in black history by Dick Gregory remember if you like what you see here in this episode if you like the episode do me a favor hit that like button and that subscribe button Grab that notification bell while you're at it so you get notified when I make a new video. Let's dig in. Chapter 4. Making something out of nothing. The little blurb at the beginning says, My grandmother doesn't have space in her head to believe there could be a Baptist on Mars. When my wife Lila and I first got together, I said, If you want this to work, because I don't give a damn. It's not about love. It's about can you be lovable. And I guess she heard me. We've been married 58 years. That's lovability, not love. Love's associated with being evil when you think somebody else is looking at your woman. Being lovable is not. But we take the wrong idea from messed up love songs. The Blues. The worst music I ever heard that promotes violence, greed, and misogyny wasn't hip-hop. It was black blues. We're the only group of men on planet Earth who sing derogatory words about our women. I caught my baby in my bed with my best friend. One, two, three, four, give me some more. Shake your moneymaker. Anytime anybody says shake your moneymaker, they're talking about your vagina. When you make money with it, you're a hoe. Men and women dance to this kind of thing. Listen to hillbilly music and see if they ever sing anything derogatory about the women they're living in their trailers with. All they say is, baby, I'm sorry. Yet nobody complains about the blues. What I was growing up, excuse me, when I was growing up, people took pride in the blues. I listened to that crap and I thought, I'm a black man, and between me and this black woman, I'm the trifling one, but our songs don't reflect that. In St. Louis, when I was growing up, nobody came there but blues singers. Where were you going to see another kind of entertainer? I try to avoid listening to the blues. Ever listen to the blues and wonder why your love affairs are so bad? My baby done left me. Little five-year-old children singing that mess. My baby done left me. That's why I used to slip off to the opera, man. I didn't want to hear none of that blues mess. A blues man will sing about Blue Monday. Man, you're going to take the universal God's Monday and make it blue because you messed up? Blue Monday. Ain't that a bitch, huh? What I'm saying is be careful with what you let into your mind. I don't know anyone who loves the blues who is happy. The arts and creative endeavors are serious business. The Harlem Renaissance. The first two decades of the 20th century were a crucial time for black folks. I already told you about black people running from the south like it was on fire going north and west to try to find better jobs and get out from under the thumb of the Ku Klux Klan, convict leasing and all that other racist mess. Then came World War I. Now President Woodrow Wilson was a segregationist, but that didn't stop him from talking about democracy until his lips were about to fall off. When he got the United States involved in the war against Germany in 1917, he said it was to make the world safe for democracy. Black folks were a big part of that. 367,000 black people joined the armed forces in World War I, and 200,000 went to fight in Europe. This wasn't like the Civil War when black men were fighting not to be slaves. Over in Europe, we were fighting for our country and for the world. We fought bravely, and a lot of us didn't come back. Then after going over there and fighting and dying for democracy and for the sake of the world, black men came back here wanting some democracy of our own. 
But guess what we found instead? The same old racist crap. Segregation, job, job discrimination, housing discrimination, and every other kind of Asian you could think of here in our home nation. Everything we had faced before in the North and South, only now we weren't having it. We protested, and when whites tried to get violent, black people got violent back. Up north in the cities, black folks got what you call consciousness. We started thinking about our situation and decided that we were going to get pushed around like before. We also found a lot of ways to express what we were feeling about race and politics, but also about life. And that's how the Harlem Renaissance was born. There were so many black people in Harlem and New York City that it was like the capital of black America. That's why so many black novelists, poets, painters, and musicians made their way to Harlem. It was a black artistic explosion. It was a long time before I knew anything about it. Where were you going to learn in St. Louis where I grew up? The Harlem Renaissance was something, man. So many great artists. Writers like Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, Claude McKay, County Cullen, Jesse Redmond Fawcett, Rudolph Fisher, Gene Toomer, Arna Bonton, and James Weldon Johnson. Painters and sculptors such as William H. Johnson, Malvin Gray Johnson, Archibald J. Motley Jr., Aaron Douglas, Augusta Savage, and Jacob Lawrence. There were even movie directors like Oscar Michaud, whose brother ran a bookstore in Harlem where a lot of intellectual black folks hung out, talking about the issues of the day. If you want to talk about music, that was the period when Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Sidney Bechet, Bechet? Bechet? I'm going with Bechet, UB Blake, and a whole bunch more came into their own, and sooner or later all of them found their way to Harlem. In some respects, the Harlem Renaissance was similar to other movements. By the time somebody got around to giving it a name, it was already going strong. That was true of jazz and the blues, too. But if you want to point to an official starting date for the Harlem Renaissance, you have to mention Alan Leroy Locke. Alan Locke was born in Philadelphia in 1885. He went to Harvard University and became the first black Rhodes Scholar studying over in England. Then he started teaching at Harvard, where... W.E.B. Du Bois encouraged him to get his Ph.D. In 1918, Locke wrote an essay called The Role of the Talented Tenth. Just like W.E.B., he thought it was the duty of college-educated blacks to lead other black folks. In 1925, he put together a special Harlem issue of a magazine called Survey Graphic. And that same year, he edited a whole book called The New Negro. Man, what didn't that book have in it? All kinds of work by black folks. Writing by Toomer, McKay, Bonton, Hurston, Fisher, James Weldon Johnson, Du Bois, Kelly Miller, E. Franklin Frazier, and a whole bunch of others. Artwork by Aaron Douglas and Miguel Covarrubias. Locke writes near the end of the introduction to his book, Negro life is not only establishing new contacts and founding new centers, it is finding a new soul. There is a fresh spiritual and cultural focusing. There is a renewed race spirit that consciously and proudly sets itself apart. It was on. So much great work. Jacob Lawrence made a whole bunch of paintings about what's called the Great Migration from the South. The paintings are powerful. You can look at them all day. You've heard about Sherlock Holmes and Watson? One was a detective, the other was a doctor? Well, the Harlem Renaissance writer 
Rudolph Fisher wrote about a character who was a doctor and a detective, and the book was sharp as hell. Check it out, The Conjure Man Dies. Or another novel he wrote, The Walls of Jericho. Those black folks had a sense of humor, too. George S. Schuyler wrote a novel called Black No More about a dude who came up with a way to turn black people white. <laughs> oh, God. Kind of tragic. None of them topped Langston Hughes, though. He captured the spirit of the whole thing. He'd write poems that were beautiful but seemed simple and easy to write. Until you tried to do it yourself, that is. Take his poem, Harlem Night Song. Look at this here. Across the Harlem rooftops, moon is shining, night sky is blue, stars are great drops of golden dew. And this. Come, let us roam the night together singing. George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was a brilliant scientist. But what do you know about him? Right? He came up with all kinds of stuff to do with the peanut. That makes people laugh and it makes him sound like a joke. When Carver was one of the most brilliant people this country ever produced, he helped a whole lot of folks. Some of the ways he helped southern farmers involved peanuts, and some didn't. Carver was born into slavery in Missouri in the 1860s. A white German dude named Moses Carver had bought George's parents in the 1850s. George's father died before George was born, and most of George's 11 brothers and sisters died before they were grown. Damn. In the years when George was a baby, kidnappers would come from Arkansas at night and snatch black folks, slaves, and free blacks alike, alike and sell them into slavery. They grabbed George and his mother when George wasn't but a week old. There are a couple of stories about how George got rescued. As one story goes, when the kidnappers were riding away, George fell off the buckboard of the wagon and some kind folks found him and took him to a home for lost children until his owner came and got him. <clears throat> Another, George's master paid a detective to find the kidnapped kids. In any case, they never found George's mother, but George and his brother made it back to Moses Carver and after slavery ended, Moses raised them as his own kids. That shows you something right there. Moses Carver Moses Carver was from Germany. He wasn't raised with the same kind of racist bullshit as folks in America. It didn't stop him from owning slaves, but it did mean that when slavery was over, he was willing to treat George like his own. And Moses' wife might have felt the same way because she taught George to read and write. Where George grew up, though, most folks most white folks didn't feel that way and because he was black he wasn't allowed to attend public school there was a school for blacks 10 miles away though in Neosho Missouri right near the Kansas border and George wanted to learn so bad that he lived with the family in Fort Scott Kansas in order to attend but he left Fort Scott after he saw some white folks kill a black man right in front of him he never forgot that. He went to a bunch of different schools before he graduated from high school in Kansas. After that, he worked as a farmer and a ranch hand before going back to school at Simpson College in Iowa. One of his instructors noticed how well George could paint flowers and plants. He painted all his life and suggested that he study botany at Iowa State Agricultural College and that's where he headed next. He had the school's, excuse me, he was the school's first black student. He got a bachelor's and a master's degree there, and he wrote a thesis about plants engineered by humans. You've already read about Booker T. Washington running the Tuskegee Institute. Well, 
He brought George Washington Carver to Tuskegee in 1896 to run the Agricultural Department. Carver stayed for 47 years. Now here's where the bullshit comes in. When people talk about Carver's work, usually during Black History Month, they'll say, Oh yeah, that's the dude who thought of all the ways you can use a peanut. Which makes you picture a grown-ass man sitting there playing with peanuts all day. Yes, George did invent products made from peanuts, but the truth is, most of them didn't sell. What he did do was he saw that soil was worn out because farmers kept planting cotton all the time. He said that if it was going to grow anything more, and if farmers and other folks wanted to make money, not to mention eat, the soil had to be restored. So he came up with the idea to get nitrogen back into the soil through what is now called crop rotation. In between planting cotton, farmers could plant sweet potatoes, soybeans, and yes, peanuts. George Washington Carver saved southern farmers, which is the same thing as saying he saved the south. A black man saved the south. Think about that for a minute. Carver was tight with Henry Ford, the automaker. Ford knew how brilliant Carver was. Ford had a plantation in Georgia, and Carver helped oversee the crops there. In exchange, Ford donated a lot of money to the Tuskegee Institute. Later, during World War II, when Ford needed rubber for his cars, but there was a shortage because the military needed it for weapons, Ford and Carver worked together with different plants until they discovered that goldenrod could be used to make a rubber substitute. That's pretty impressive. I did not know that. Now let me take you up to the universal level. Here's how the universe works. That Ford boy didn't invent the car. The automobile was invented by the Derea brothers in Massachusetts. Ford and the other automakers stole it. What did Ford invent? The plant. In other words, before that you made cars one at a time. Then Ford came up with the assembly line. With it they could make a whole bunch of cars at once. How did that happen? One day George Washington Carver said to Henry Ford, I've got a package for you to take back to show your engineers. This is the study of plants. If they study this and see the way plants work, you can make more than one car at a time. That's why the site of mass production for products all over the world is called a plant. Louis Armstrong, talking about the Harlem Renaissance, I mentioned Louis Armstrong, trumpet player, singer, born in New Orleans in 1901, died 70 years later. In those 70 years, he turned American music on its head. Around the time Armstrong was born, his daddy left him and his mama, his daddy left him and his mama. Louis was born in a part of New Orleans called Back of Town. Now that should tell you something right there. Poor? That little boy had to scrape around in garbage cans just to find something to eat. Where he grew up was full of prostitutes. So that little rag wearing somebody grew up fast. One thing they had there, dance halls. So Louis Armstrong grew up hearing the blues and this other kind of music that was so new it didn't even have an official name yet. Armstrong was around 10 years old when a newspaper first called it jazz. <laughs> like a lot of poor kids, Armstrong had a way of getting into trouble and one time it got so bad that they put him in a home. And that's where somebody put a cornet like a trumpet but smaller in the boy's hand. Nothing was the same after that for him or for us. He learned to play and when he got a little older he performed in a jazz band with a dude named King Oliver. 
Later, he formed his own band called the Hot Five. Another band of his was called the Hot Seven. You want to talk about some trumpet playing? He made that thing sound like a bull charging around, like something was coming at you, and if you didn't get out of the way, you'd be sorry. They say Armstrong played so loud that when he recorded with his band, he had to stand outside the room with the door open just so he wouldn't drown everybody else out. Those tunes he recorded in the 1920s like West End Blues, Potato Head Blues, and Wild Man Blues, they still sound fresh today, like he's got something to say and he's saying it through his horn. But it wasn't just that he played a ferocious trumpet. Beginning with Armstrong, musicians could play as individuals. The sound didn't have to be from the whole band. It could be your own expression, too. Armstrong got the nickname Pops and Satchmo. They called him that second one because his mouth was so big it looked like an open satchel bag. Satchel mouth became Satchmo. Whatever they called him, he revolutionized playing, singing too. His voice had that scratchy sound when you heard him. You knew in a second who it was. After that, folks didn't want to hear singing with fancy European airs and all the rest of that prissy stuff. Pops taught America what singing was all about. Duke Ellington. There's a whole lot of things folks can't agree on. But here's one thing everybody agrees on, whether they're black or white, rich or poor. Life isn't fair. You ask a rich man why he gets to inherit all that money and have all those cars and women when other folks don't have a pot to piss in and he'll shrug and tell you, hey, don't blame me, life isn't fair. A poor man trying to explain to his woman why he can't afford to give her diamonds and bracelets and fancy vacations the way other men do for their women. He'll tell her, ain't my fault. I'm out here busting out my behind like everybody else, but life isn't fair. To prove it isn't fair, check this out. A hundred people had to go without good looks, brains, charm, and every last bit of natural talent. Just so one black man born in 1899 could have it all. Excuse me. Mr. Edward Kennedy Ellington. That's Duke Ellington to you. Duke was born in Washington, D.C. and made his way as a young man to New York City in Harlem. Up there, money was tight at first, but he got by playing piano at rent parties, which were just what they sound like, parties folks had held to raise money to pay the rent. Some of the other black dudes playing at those parties were the best piano men around. James P. Johnson, Fats Waller, Willie the Lion Smith. They called Smith the Lion because of his bravery in France in World War I. See there? Anywhere you go, there's a black person kicking ass. Johnson, Waller, and Smith played what was called stride piano. Think about your favorite baseball player running up and down the court like he owns it, and that's what those three men did on piano. They can make the key do anything. A little bit of classical technique, whole lot of black style. Now, Duke couldn't play better than those men, but he couldn't even play it. Now, Duke couldn't play better than those men. Maybe he couldn't even play as well as them, but you'd better believe he learned from them. Then he took that knowledge and mixed it up with everything else. His brains, his good looks, his fancy clothes, his smooth talk, his style and charm. That man could charm the wings off a bumblebee. That was one black man who didn't let racism touch him. He just glided past it to get wherever he was going, like Michael Jordan going in for a layup. It was like he charmed racism itself. He could also turn that smooth charm on anybody. Duke had women like a library's got books. He had other kinds of appetites too. 
he could eat hot dogs and ice cream like nobody you ever saw without getting fat, and he could drink you under the table. Duke was so smooth that he could fire you from his band without your even realizing it. He wouldn't say you're fired. He'd just hire somebody else who played the same instrument as you, only 13 times better, to the point where you were so embarrassed you'd up and fire yourself. He even stole other band's leaders. Wait, excuse me. He even stole other band leaders' players that same smooth way. Ben Webster, a tenor sax player, was playing in Cab Calloway's band but wanted to play with Duke, and Duke wanted Ben. He told him, I would love to have you in the band, but Cab is my brother and I can't take anybody out of his band. But if you didn't have a job, I'd have to give you one. Next thing you know, Ben had quit Cab's band. Since he wasn't with Cab anymore, Duke hired him. See how smooth he was? If Duke met folks he couldn't charm, he was ready for them too. His road manager said that Duke packed a pistol and knew how to use it. Duke had his own way of doing things. Seven or eight decades before folks started talking about thinking outside the box, one of his favorite sayings was, no boxes. Short and to the point, right? He was like that with music too. Any idea you could think of, he had already done it and done it better. Here's one idea Duke had. When he started leading bands and composing music for them, he used his imagination. But he observed what was going on around him too. He said, you can't write music right unless you know how the man that'll play it plays poker. You've got to write with certain men in mind. You write just for their abilities and natural tendencies and give them places where they do their best. He did that for just about all his band members and they became famous for it all over the world. He wrote music that way for Jimmy Hodges who played the alto saxophone. Hodges had that sweet sound. He could play one note so nice you'd forget there were other notes. He wrote music that way for Harry Carney who played this low sound on the baritone sax and gave Duke's, tone, Duke's tunes the growl they had sometimes. He wrote music that way for Cat Anderson and Cootie Williams, who played trumpet notes so high you felt like you were hearing something from outer space. Duke wrote music that way for his whole big band, sweet playing Jimmy Hodges, growling Harry Carney, Screaming trumpets, creamy woodwinds, and rumbling bass, bass. <laughs> Excuse me. And he didn't forget to put those drums in there. And the whole time, Duke himself would be tinkling those piano keys and signaling the band with his eyes. That was one smoking hot band. It was even hotter after Duke hooked up with Billy Strayhorn and started recording some of the tunes that that little five foot three inch glasses wearing dude wrote. Lush Life, Chelsea Bridge, Take the A Train. The Duke Ellington Orchestra was an international band. It wasn't just that they went everywhere. Oh, Duke traveled to more countries than a lot of folks have heard of. Met presidents and prime ministers, kings and queens. But what made them an international band was they could go anywhere and hear the music there and Duke would write music inspired by that country, and he could make the music sound like it came both from that country and from a black fried chicken eating brother from D.C., which it was. That's why he could make albums and sell them. That's why he could make albums and call them Far East Suite and the Afro-Eurasian Eclipse. Go listen to Far East Suite and check out a tune called Blue Pepper and see if you can keep your feet from moving, I dare you. He didn't forget about the folks back home. One of his best records was called Harlem and another was called New Orleans Sweet. But Duke was at home anywhere in the world. Thanks for joining me. Hope you, join in the, hope you tune in to the next episode. And in the meantime, hit that like and subscribe button.
Stay round.